Okay, so tonight we're going to be looking at the last year of the Buddha's life. The information mainly comes from the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, which is found in the Diga Nikaya. It's one of the longest discourses in the canon. If it's written out in Pali or in、uh, translation, it comes to around a hundred or more pages. So that's quite a substantial work, and it opens about a month or two before the rains retreat, which the Lord Buddha was to spend in Vaisali, and it ends at the Parinibbana. Or in, in fact, it goes on a little longer than that. But、um, the discourse goes up to the Parinibbana, which was at the Bisakha full moon day, the following May. So the rains retreat starts in July. It's a month or two before. That means it's either May or June, and it goes up to the following May. So the period is roughly one year. Now. Just to orientate on the map, the map, the the large map, we can see where it's situated on the inset. So on on the inset, it just covers this kind of small area in the north east corner of what is today India. Part of this is Nepal as well now, but in those days. The, 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 those distinctions didn't exist, and this whole area was basically known as the Middle Country. So, just to get an idea of where where things are, this is Lumbini, which is where the Buddha was born. This is Uruvela, which is now called Bodh Gaya. Gaya is this whole area here, and Bodh Gaya. Bod is means Bodhi. It means the place in Gaya where the Buddha attained Sambodhi. You see, so they now call it Bod Gaya.、Uh, in in the suttas, it's called Uruvela, means Great Sands. And then, as you know, he went across to Isipatana, which is where he gave the first discourse, and We are now going to trace the last journey that the Buddha made, which is from Rajagaha, starting here. He goes up and he spends the rains retreat in Vaisali, and then afterwards he makes his way up to Kusinara,、uh, which is where he entered Parinibbana. So the discourse opens in Rajagaha, and it opens. In a way, at a crucial time, because the king of Magadha, this area here, is Magadha, and it was a monarchy. You'll remember that the first monastery that was ever given to the Lord Buddha was given to him by King Bimbisara at Rajagaha. But six years prior to this time, King Bimbisara had been killed. By his son Ajatasattu. Now, there's an interesting trailer to this because Ajatasattu himself was killed by his son, and that son was also killed by his son, and that that son was killed by his son. It went on for seven generations, and eventually, the people revolted.、Uh, they said, "This is a family of patricides. This is a family that you know continually kills their fathers." And they don't want a family like that ruling over them any- anymore. So they overthrew that family, and they brought in a new kingly lineage. And that new kingly lineage eventually led to Ashoka, to Emperor Ashoka, who had his capital here at what what is in, at this time called Pataligama. It's now called Patna. It's still a big city now, and still a ma- major city because of its position, I suppose. Really, this is the Ganges River, and you've got these other rivers coming down and joining here. You see, and then flowing down through、uh, Calcutta into the 
Bay of Bengal that it goes all the it goes all the way down here. Uh, so this this at that time uh, this was only a small village. I'll come to that in a minute. But Ajata Sattu had killed his father six years before, and uh, at this point he was king of Magadha, this area, and he was thinking of attacking the Vajians, and the Vajians are in this area. Now these two represent two different forms of state organization, because Magadha was a, was a monarchy, and the Vajians were a republic. The Sakians also were a republic. The, the Malians here also were republics. But these republics were at that time really being overthrown by the rise of the monarchies. The monarchies were really in the ascendance, the ascendancy at that time. So Ajatasattu was thinking of attacking the Vajians. Uh, but he wasn't sure whether he could get away with it, I suppose, if, if, if you want to put it like that. So he came to the Lord Buddha and he asked Lord Buddha's advice. Now it's interesting, the Lord Buddha didn't answer directly to the king what he should do. Instead, he turned to Ananda and he asked Ananda some questions. The way it's framed in the sutta is like this. He asks Ananda, do, do the Vajians assemble regularly and assemble frequently? And Ananda says, they do assemble regularly and they do assemble frequently. And then the Lord Buddha says, for as long as the Vajians assemble regularly and assemble frequently, they will not undergo decline. This whole thing is about de de preventing decline. He tells, basically, what are the conditions for the Vajians to prosper and under which circumstances you know Ajatasattu will not be able to overthrow them. So the first thing uh, that is important for this Republic is that it must assemble regularly and assemble frequently. Now it's quite interesting because wh what that would have meant is that all the elders of the tribe would come together on a regular and a frequent basis, they would come together in a face-to-face -face democracy and they would have what is really what was originally meant by a parliament. A parliament is a place where everybody can come together and speak. So that's how they would organize and make their decisions, is by coming together and discussing you know the, the various issues that needed to be dealt with by the tribe or the community or whatever but the important thing from my point of view anyway the important thing is that this is a uh, a face to face democracy it's not like a representative democracy but it's where all the elders all those who are considered mature members of the group come together and then they discuss whatever needs to be discussed in the parliament. And then the second one you see is that they must assemble unanimously, rise unanimously and carry out their Vajian duties un unanimously. Again, an important uh, principle, I think. These days, as you know, parliaments are actually split against each other and people just vote against each other more or less to spite each other. They don't try to come to any sort of unanimity about the decisions that they're making. But the Buddha told that that's an important principle and what it means is that people have to be mature enough to put aside their own views and their own ideas if they see that they're in the minority and come to a unanimous decision with the majority. That actually takes some maturity, you see. It's not something that can be done you know, just by people who are uh, just seeking their own ends. They, they, they must be able to look further than that and look to see 
what is good for the community that they're representing, if you like. The third one is the only one here that I don't really go along with and I don't really understand and it doesn't fit in with the rest of the Buddha's teaching. But according to the text, he says, For as long as the Vajians do not establish new laws which were not established or cut off old laws that were established. Now this is very strange because in the Vinaya, the Buddha himself did establish new laws that were not established. And he did um, change those laws as well because things being impermanent, uh, the situation changes and the people must be able to make new rules so that they, are, you know, so that they apply to the conditions that are prevailing. You can't make new, you can't make rules now for what's happening, say, you know, a thousand years in the future. So, it's kind of a bit strange because the Lord Buddha, sometimes people would come to him, he would lay down a Vinaya rule and then people would come to him and say, that's not, that's not good doing it like that. We, we think it uh, should be done in a different way. And the Lord Buddha would agree if he thought it was reasonable. And he would actually change, change the rules. So the rules even in the Vinaya were not fixed like that. The Lord Buddha himself was very flexible. Not on principles, but on application, you see. So that's the thing. But anyway, here it says, must not establish new laws which were not established established or cut off old laws that were established. The fourth one is to honor the elders of the Vajians, respect, revere, worship and think them worth listening to. Again, another important principle. Speaking as an elder myself these days, I think uh, having respect for elders is a good thing. <laughs> a lot of modern society is kind of built on a cult, not exactly of youth, but of um, like that kind of age period around 30, 40, where people are you know, successful in their careers and so on and so forth. In, in fact, there's some reason for that because they're the kind of um, motivators and the uh, kind of driving force behind the society. But there's also a, a lot to be gained by listening to people who have that much more experience, who have gone through that period themselves, have matured beyond that period, and actually have, you know, a wider perspective as to what is important in life, which might be, for instance, keeping up the customs of the community. Like, I think people who are very successful are very focused, for instance, just on this life. Now, that's one thing. But people who are older, they have a wider perspective on what is happening. They can see the whole culture, how things are changing, how things are developing, whether they're going into decline, whether they're going into, uh, you know, uh, advancing in a wholesome way or whatever. They have a different perspective on life, I think. And I think we should really have respect for the, for the elders, you know and listen to what they have to say and, and really uh, try to take their views into account because their experience is so valuable. Okay, now then, the next one is that they should not coerce and force their women and girls to dwell with them against their will. To us, in a way, it sounds obvious, but this is an important principle again. What it's really saying is that women and girls have a, a basic set of human rights. We, we take it for granted that they have a basic set of human rights. But in the Brahminical society, even to this day, they do not have those rights. Girls will be married off, you know, before they even reach puberty. Whether it's, you know, with their agreement or not with their agreement, I mean, what can an immature girl you know, how, how can she have a, 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 a proper choice in, in such a matter, you know, she doesn't. And in actual fact, it's just the family who arranges their marriage or whatever, you know. But it's, it's important that the Buddha 
I think myself anyway, it's important that the Buddha saw that women and girls cannot be treated just like property, just as chattels. You know, in a lot of societies, women are just part of the property. That you, you know, as a, as a, a male householder, if you like, he would have his home, he would have his women, he would have his animals, and they're all kind of grouped together. And uh, they, you know, they, the women have no more choice as to what happens to them than the animals have. But the Buddha said that it cannot cannot be like that. You must respect the human rights for for women and girls. So, you see, it's again a very different view on how society should be run. And I think the Buddha really is not only saying how the Vajians should be constituted, but I think this is something to do with how society should be constituted. We'll see in, in a minute that he also applied this to his own community. These rules are also, most of them anyway, are also applied to his own community. So we can understand that this is his idea, really, of how societies should be organized. Then the sixth one is that the Vajians should honor the Vajian shrines, respect, revere, and worship them, and do not allow the righteous sacrifices that were formerly given formally made to be neglected. Again, a very interesting item in this list because most people, I think, believe that the Lord Buddha was actually against all forms of sacrifice. But that's not really the case. What he was against was unrighteous forms of sacrifice, like the sacrifice of animals. You know, in those days, they would even sacrifice large animals if they could afford it. They, they would do um, like horse sacrifice and they would even do human sacrifice, you see. So, these are unrighteous sacrifices. But the real sacrifice, what they would do, the righteous sacrifices, what they would do, in fact, people would organize a sacrifice, like a family would organize a sacrifice and then they would invite other people to come to that sacrifice and they would feed them. You see, it's like a dana. It's actually like a dana. And this idea of sharing what you have with others, which is the principle, of course, behind the dana, th this is part of these righteous sacrifices. And that is not opposed at all, of course by the Buddha and we can understand it. But as soon as we hear the word sacrifice, we think of sacrificing, you know, creatures' lives, like animal lives or something like that. But that's not what, what was intended. The, the, what would happen, it would be like a potlatch, if you know what a potlatch is. Then the rich members of the community would organize a sacrifice and then they would invite everybody in and give them presents and feed them. And that would increase their standing in the community. That was part of the idea behind it, that their ability to share their wealth uh, in, such a, in such a way would increase their standing. And that's a righteous sacrifice and was not opposed by the Lord Buddha. In fact, it's adopted if you think about it, because that's exactly what we do when we have dhanas, and dhana is a central part of the uh, Buddhist teaching. And then the final thing in this list for preventing decline is that they should make good arrangements in regard to the lawful protection, safety and guarding of the arahats. It means really, I don't think it just means the arahats. It means, you know, all holy men, all good teachers or whatever. And I also think, at least from my own perspective, that this is um, an, Im an important thing as well. Because we see at the time, for instance, of King Ashoka. King Ashoka was actually, you know, he's gone down in history as one of the greatest supporters of the Buddhist religion. But he didn't just support the Buddhist religion. He also supported the Jainas. He also supported the Brahmins. That means the righteous Brahmins, not people who are doing wrong things. And he also supported the... Um, what are called paribhajikas, it means the wanderers. 
So Ashoka would support all people who are te teaching good and basic moral practices. Yeah, And I think in a multicultural society like our own, and like virtually everywhere is becoming because of this interchange and you know the the increase in communications is giving rise to multicultural societies all over the world then we must have that kind of idea that we should protect people you know if they're muslims and they're teaching morality then we should you know in in a state because we can't control what people believe we can't tell them they must be buddhist if they're muslim or if they're christian then they must have uh, proper teachers there, and those teachers should be protected and, you know, given basic rights to be able to teach and so on. We want to claim those rights for ourselves here in Malaysia. You know, we're in a, we're in a minority as a Buddhist group, but we want those rights, so we must also be prepared, I think, to, you know, to give those rights to other people. It's, uh, you know, in a way it's obvious, but people don't, don't always think about it in that sense. But, but if, if we want to claim rights, then we must be giving those rights to other people. And that's the way, that's one way to ensure that we're living in really a harmonious society rather than in a society where everybody is fighting each other, you know. Now the the important thing he gave these he gave these teachings to the to Ananda uh, and the Jatasattu was you know overheard this teaching later actually what what happened just to conclude this little this part of it later what happened is that the Jatasattu managed to sow discord amongst the Vajians and he managed to break up their assemblies and cause uh, problems for them. So th they weren't able to follow these rules and at that point he invaded the country and was able to overthrow them. But as long as they followed these rules he was not able to overcome them, you see. But now the important thing is after Ajatasattu went then the Buddha turned to Ananda and then he applied most of these rules to the Sangha, and this is important. You see, a lot of these are the, are the same. Not all of them. I'll, I'll show you what are the differences in a minute. But for the preventing decline in the Sangha, he said more or less the same thing. For as long as the monks assemble regularly and assemble frequently. Now, as you know, the monks have to assemble every couple of weeks to recite the party market. They must come together for that event and that happens every fortnight on the new moon and on the full moon. And then also if there's any Sangha business that needs to be carried out, anything in the community that needs to be discussed, you see, they've assembled and uh, they're together and they can discuss it. So this principle of coming together regularly and frequently uh, is an important um, part of how we keep harmony in the Sangha also. And then the second one is that they should assemble unanimously, rise unanimously and carry out their Sangha duties unanimously. Also very very important and this is put into effect in, in this way. For instance if we're ordaining somebody the way it's done is that the the monk responsible will will make an announcement at the beginning. He will say, "We are about to ordain th this boy or this man," and then he says, "At this point, we are ordaining that person. If anybody disagrees with this ordination, let them speak, and if they don't." disagree with the ordination, they can just keep quiet. And he makes that announcement three times. It's done very formally. But it's a very important thing. If somebody does actually speak up and say, they might know for instance that, that person is on the run from prison or is in debt or hasn't got the permission of his parents or you know any one of a number of problems that might be there 
they they will know uh, if they know that then they should they have to speak up and if one person speaks up and says that they don't agree with this ordination if we're just talking about ordination or if it's a rehabilitation or whatever it is whatever sangha um, act we're we're putting through at that point uh, if somebody disagrees it cannot go through it stops there and then it must be a unanimous decision everybody must agree to go ahead with whatever they're doing making the ordination making the rehabilitation or whatever it is and then not establish new laws which were not established or cut off old laws that were established as I say I don't necessarily ag 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 agree exactly with this but the fact of the matter is that the Vinaya laws that were laid down by the Buddha two and a half thousand years ago are exactly the laws that we apply now in all, all the different groups that means whether it's in the Theravada, the Mahayana or the Vajrayana you know, no laws have been uh, cut off no new laws have been introduced into it the rules that were established at Lord Buddha's time or very shortly thereafter are the rules that are, that are still applied today and they've not changed over two and a half thousand years and I think that's really an incredible thing if you think about it then the fourth condition for preventing decline is that they should honor the elder monks respect revere worship and think them worth listening to again another important principle you know if an elder monk comes into the monastery or comes in to the temple then we you know we are a, 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 you know we always line up in, in uh, according to seniority seniority is absolutely central to the organization of the Sangha we don't look at other things as I've explained before we don't look to see if a person is an Arahat or a Sotapanna or is a Putajana that means somebody who's not, not attained anything or whether he's even it's something basic like good monk or a bad monk we only we just look at their uh, seniority seniority is crucial and another part of this is that we should think them worth listening to it's again having the respect for people who have more experience so you know at the party mocker it's customary at the end of the recital of the rules then the elder monk in the group will be asked to give uh, some sort of encouragement to the other monks it's not always done nowadays but the principle is there and it, it is uh, it is done in a, in a lot of places that they they will actually listen to the advice of the elder monk one of the elder monks at the end of the party mocker to get encouragement for the you know for the coming few weeks or whatever <coughs> then you see for the vajians it was not coerce and force their women and girls but for the monks it was not come under the influence of craving which has arisen for continued existence very interesting actually because as you know there's three types of craving that's the craving for sensuality uh, the craving for the end of existence and the craving for continued existence but the, the Buddha has um, singled out this this idea of not coming under the influence of craving which has arisen for continued existence and I think the reason must be that for the monastics you see they must keep their eyes on what is the real end game for the monastic which is to attain Nibbana they shouldn't be going for continued existence in heaven or continued existence on earth even though they can do a lot of good on earth or they can enjoy their uh, merits in heaven that is not the proper aim for a, for a monastic you see whether a monk or a nun their proper aim and what they must keep in mind at all times is that they should be aiming for Nibbana it's completely uh, like central to the teaching that the monastics must not lower their aim to, to something less than that and then whereas the Vajians should respect their shrines and make sacrifices the monks should have desire for forest dwellings again another important thing because you know in the temples a lot of the monks I've seen are really really so busy they don't have time for their own development they're so busy teaching 
I mean, sometimes they're teaching, you know, virtually all day. They hardly have a break. I can remember, uh, actually, even when I was myself in um, typing, it was difficult to get any time when I was not not busy, actually. You know, so difficult to get time for meditation. That's one of the reasons why I moved to Vivekavana, you know, Vivekavana meaning solitude grove, so I could get some solitude and could get some time for my own practice. And um, even if monks and nuns are teaching, nothing wrong with that. We, we, we have to teach anything that, you know, if you've benefited by the Dhamma yourself, then of course you want to share it with other people. So, so that's, that's not um, a, a problem in itself. You know, we, we want to share the teaching with others, but uh, they must still be able to get this solitude and this, you know, this space where you can carry on with your own uh, development. So myself, you know, I give these teachings, then it's not very much. We, we, I only do this talk once a month at the moment, you know. But most days, I'm actually quite living in solitude up there on the mountain. And then the final one is that they should attend to the ways of mindfulness so that their fellow celibates who are well behaved can come and having come can live comfortably. That means if, a, if in a community people, the monastics are maintaining their mindfulness then there will be you know, a significant reduction in conflict. And then Others who come into that community, who join that community for a shorter or a longer time, can live there comfortably without, you know, these kind of uh, rivalries, jealousies and conflicts that arise in, you know, basically they can arise in all communities. But in a community that is living mindfully, that shouldn't happen. People who have mindfulness will, will understand when those sort of defilements are arising in their minds, will want to uh, put those sort of things aside and live in a comfortable way with everybody else who is in the community. So that's the, um, the seventh condition. In fact, after this, there are more and more conditions. There's another seven, and then another seven, and then another seven, and then another seven, and another seven, and another six. But those myself, I believe, uh, I made a study of this, and uh, I believe, I think it can be shown that they come into this discourse at a later time. Now, in fact, I was not actually going to get into the teaching very much, but those principles, you see, for the organization of the community, that means the society that people are living in, and the organization of the Sangha are so important, and it's so central to what the Buddha was teaching at these last period. Now, for the rest of this, everywhere he goes, he's giving teachings. This is a long discourse, and there's a lot of teachings that have been recorded. But most of them are on these themes as to how the sasana, you know, can continue after the Lord Buddha has passed away. This is the important thing that the Lord Buddha is trying to do in the last year of his life, is lay down the principles whereby the, uh, the you know, the sasana or the dispensation will continue into the future after he himself has passed into Parinibbana. And then there's many teachings given throughout. So I just wanted to explain those basic principles because I think that they're so important to the sasana now actually. I think they're really important because we see that the sasana is organized on completely different principles now. And if we really want to put the Lord Buddha's teaching back on course, uh, then we should go back to the original teaching and see what he thought was important and what he thought was the way to see to the longevity of the sasana. Now all of that took place, or that teaching took place in Rajagaha. After that, the Lord Buddha left Rajagaha and he went to Ambalatika. Then he went to Nalanda. Now Nalanda, as you know, became the seat 
of the of the first Buddhist university. In fact, as far as I know, it's actually the first university in the world, and certainly one of the largest at its height when the Chinese pilgrim Zhuangshan went to India. There were about ten thousand people who were who were studying at Nalanda at that time. You know, it's a big teaching institution that has been organized there. And now another important thing, you see, they were not just teaching. Although this was a Buddhist university, they were not just teaching Buddhism. They would teach also. They were teaching the Vedas there. Also, they were teaching Sanskrit there. Also, they were teaching literature and the arts and the sciences like astrology and geography. All of these things were being taught in that university. It was really a universal teaching center. That's what a university really means: a universal teaching center where all forms of knowledge would be taught. And so that's Nalanda. Now, why was it founded at Nalanda? Nalanda was the place where Sariputta was born, and Sariputta. Was the great interpreter, the great disciple, of course, and the great interpreter of the Buddha's teaching. So, when they founded the university, they founded it at Sariputta's hometown, which was Nalanda. In fact, in the Theravada text, it tells that his hometown was between Ambalatika and Pataligama, and it was called Nalagamana. Nalagamana. And they don't identify it with Nalanda, but in the other early texts, it's identified with Nalanda. And myself, Nalagamana and Nalanda, you know, they're so close in form that I believe that they refer to the same place. And something that would back this up is that when the Buddha got to Nalanda during this last journey, Sariputta was there. And that's a time, actually, when Sariputta made—it's called his lion's roar. In fact, what what he what he said was, "There is nobody ever born or ever known who is as great as the Lord Buddha." Basically, that that's what he said. You know, that the Lord Buddha is the greatest person uh, who has ever been born. And then the Lord Buddha turned to him and he said, "Well, have you met all the other Buddhas?" And Sariputta said, "Well, I haven't met all the other Buddhas, but what I do know is that anybody who becomes a Buddha must go through the same door and attain to the same to the same things. And you have gone through that door and you have attained it, so you must be at that level. That's how he explains it. You see, and the Buddha accepts it. It's quite quite good. But Sariputta was at Nalanda. Later in this story." We will see before the Lord Buddha passes away that Sariputta, who was living in Savatthi at the time, he comes down to Nalanda, and about three months before the Lord Buddha passes away, he passes away in the actually in the room that he was born in, in the same room that he was born in. He came back to his hometown, and then he died there. Now then, after that. The Lord Buddha walked to Pataligama. Pataligama at that time had only just been founded. It wasn't the major city. It became Ashoka's、uh, capital. You see later, what's now called Patna. But in the, at that time, it would only just been found. Patali means this trumpet flower. It's what we call the trumpet flower. Gama means village. It's trumpet flower village. And they just founded it. And there's a kind of nice story. About partly Gama, which is that when they were, you know, it was undergoing development when the Lord Buddha got there. It was just being founded, and it was undergoing development. So some people were building big residences, and some people were building medium size. Some people were building small residences. Those who were building the big residences, it says that the large devas,、uh, you know, when they saw these residences being built, those large devas came down. From the sky, I suppose, and they took up residence there. And then, when a medium-sized 
building was being put up. Then a medium-sized David came and he took up residence there. And then, a, a, you know, in in the small residence, then only a, a, a smaller kind of Deva would be able to reside there. But the Devas were um, coming to reside in Patali Gama. And the Buddha gave a kind of prediction. In fact, in the suttas, as far as I know, there are only two predictions that the Buddha ever made, because this is not, of course, a prophetic religion. Prophecy is not important. Principle, morality, mind development, those sort of things are important. Prophecy was not considered important. One, the, other, the other thing was that he prophesied that the sasana would end after 500 years, after allowing the nuns into it. And, you know, it's unbelievable because it didn't happen. And I can't myself believe that the Lord Buddha gave that teaching. According to the discourse, then Lord Buddha said that Patali Gama would eventually become like a great city and uh, the, the central uh, cities for the Aryans, for as long as the Aryans, you know, for as long as there were, was an Aryan area. In a way, it's still a major city, you see, so, you know. We, we can understand it. But I, myself, I think what, what this is, is some sort of looking back, perhaps from Ashoka's time when it was the capital, and then they want to get the Lord Buddha's, whatever it is, you know, like a confirmation that this is, you know, an important place and uh, this is where the capital should be or some, something on that line, something on that, uh, on those grounds. Then the Lord Buddha, after he'd spent time in Pataligama, crossed the Ganges. In fact, it says that he went across the Ganges by Idi power. That means while they were waiting for rafts to come, instead of waiting for the rafts, he and the Arahat monks, just by their Idi power, crossed over the Ganges and landed on the further shore. And then there's a nice verse that goes with it. I'll just read it for you because it's... You know, it's very telling, I think, myself, and a, a very nice thing. And it shows how the Lord Buddha would interpret, you know, things that were happening in his life, if you see what I mean. So, he said, those who cross over a sea or a river do so after making a bridge and leaving the marshes behind. While people are still binding together a raft, intelligent people have crossed over. What, what, it's, what it's signifying, really, you see, is that while other people are looking for, you know, a way across samsara, those who are intelligent and have listened to the teaching of the Lord Buddha have already crossed over by their own powers. That's what it's saying. Just as they didn't wait for the raft, they just crossed over by their idi power. So the people who listened to the Buddha didn't have to wait any longer, and they crossed over samsara. That's the parallel that's being drawn. Then, after he crossed over, they walked up. They went to a couple of villages on the way. One I remember is Kotigama. They stayed there for a while. And there's another place, I think, called Nardika. Uh, they stayed there for a while. And all the time, the Lord Buddha is giving different teachings. If you want to find out the teachings, you, you, you read the discourse and find out the teachings. But in this talk, what I'm trying to concentrate on is, you know, this last period and how the Lord Buddha made this last journey and what happened on the journey. I can't give all the teachings because if I give all the teachings, I'll, I'll be here for a month of Sundays because there's so many of them and having to explain them all and everything. So he, he stopped at a couple of villages and then he went to Vaisali. There was a very important incident when he got to Vaisali, which is that he met with Ambapali. Now, Ambapali was a courtesan. Sometimes I think people think it's just like a, like a common prostitute, but it's not, it's not a common prostitute. It's an uncommon prostitute, you know. Like a courtesan would be somebody who is highly skilled in the, in all sensual arts. That means they would be able to sing, they would be able to dance, they would be able to create an essentially pleasing and satisfying environment, as well as being able to, you know, engage in satisfying sexual intercourse. That, of course, would be the culmination 
at the at the end of the night, if you like. But um, but before before that, it would be like a whole kind of uh, course of sensual pleasures that would lead up to intercourse. It's not just like like an uns unskilled worker or something, you know, like a common prostitute just is like an unskilled worker. This is something in a completely different league. This would be somebody who is very educated, who would be able to perhaps be able to read and write, uh, would certainly, you know, be skilled in various things like music and uh, dance and so on and so forth. So, uh, Ambapali was known as the courtesan of Vaisali, they w it would be very expensive to go, uh, you know, to have to spend the night. You know, not everybody would be able to afford to spend the night with Ambapali. Uh, only the very rich people. But Ambapali heard that the Lord Buddha was coming, and she went out to meet him, and then she invited him for a dana on the following day, and the Lord Buddha agreed. And then just after Ambapali had made her invitation. The princes, the Vajian princes, also came out from Vaisali and they wanted to invite the Buddha for the dana on the following day. And the Lord Buddha said, I can't because I already agreed to allow Ambapali to give the dana on the following day. Now it's very interesting, you see. Here is, first of all, a woman who is given the dana. And the Lord Buddha will not go back on his promise to her. That means he's holding her at the same level, if you like, holding her at the same level as he's holding these princes. He's making no distinction between them. But not only is she a woman, she's a courtesan. In, in, in some ways this might be thought of as a kind of low profession, if you like, uh, or an unworthy profession, especially for uh, in monastic eyes. It might be thought of as um, not worthy. But the Lord Buddha would not change his agreement to that dana. And he said, Ambapala asked for that dana and the Vajian princes can't have it. And so Ambapali, in fact, did get to give that dana. I just think that incidents like this, when we look at it, just show what the Lord Buddha's attitude was like, you know. It, it, it's so different from the kind of environment that he was in. He was showing a new way, you know, throughout his career really, he's showing a new way how to deal with people, not just with, you know, the relations between women and men, but also with the castes, you know. He wouldn't make distinctions between the castes, whether people were low caste, out caste, or high caste. Anybody was allowed into the Sangha and they lost their caste. A very important principle is that they lost their caste when they entered the Sangha, you see. And same here, he's not making a distinction. Here is a, you know, a woman with a low profession and here are rich princes and then I'm going to favor the princes. He's taking everybody at the same level. He had already promised he would give that dana to Ambapali and then he wouldn't go back on that. So Ambapali gave her dana. At the end of the dana, she actually gave her pleasure grounds to to the Sangha with Lord Buddha at the head. So that was the last of the monasteries that the Lord Buddha received was this monastery or this pleasure park that was that was given by Ambapali. As you remember, King Bimbisara gave the first one, which was Velavana in Rajagaha. At the beginning of the ministry, that means bamboo grove, if you like, bamboo wood. Uh, that's where the first one was given. And you'll remember that Anata Pindika gave another one at Sarvati. That was Jaitavana. And now the last, last monastery was given by Ambapali at Vaisali. And Ambapali herself became an Arahat nun. She ordained and then she became an Arahat. And we have her verses, which are really very poignant, I suppose. The, these verses are in really high, in high poetry. The, the poetry itself is very complicated. It's not just normal, mm, everyday poetry. It's somebody who, you know, whoever writ, wrote this is somebody who knows really the principles of high poetry, which indicates that it really does come from 
you know, somebody who was trained in those arts, as Amber Pali herself was. So there's some sort of confirmation that these verses really are from the person they are, they are said to be from. And then she tells in those verses, you know, how when she was young, she had beautiful skin, beautiful hair, beautiful eyebrows, beautiful breasts, uh, a beautiful body, and how as she's become older, her skin has become wrinkled, her hair has become grey, her eyebrows, you know, have changed, her breasts have drooped, and her body has become decayed. So her body has gone, undergone these decay, this decay and change. And so, you know, they're, they're very uh, wonderful verses. You can find them in the Terigata, which is the verses of the elder nuns. And they're a very moving and very wonderful teaching that was given by this elder nun, Ambapali. After that incident, the Lord Buddha entered into the Was. It was actually at Belua, which was south of Vaisali. It's like a little village. And he told the monks, all the monks had followed him from Rajagaha. That means, you know, it doesn't mean the whole Sangha, of course, but it would have mean, would probably have meant a large section of the Sangha. So a large section of the Sangha was with him. He went to a little village called Belua. It means wood apple. And there, uh, he said he's going to undertake the range retreat there. And he asked the monks to go and live in different villages around Vaisali because they couldn't all just manage in this one small village. So he asked them to go around to different, you know, to stay in different places around Vaisali. Then the Lord Buddha, along with Ananda, perhaps, you know, some of the monks were there as well. We don't really get to find out in the discourse. We know Ananda's there. We know the Lord Buddha's there and Ananda's there. How many other monks there might have been there, it's not clear. And it's after undertaking the was that he fell ill with dysentery. Dysentery is a very debilitating disease, as you will know. You know, and he's 80 years old at this point. So, I mean, you know, he's quite an age. And then he's got dysentery. And he, you know, he was very seriously ill. And Ananda says something like, I've seen the Buddha when he's flourishing. And now I've seen the Buddha when he is very poorly. And, you know, it makes me shake. It makes me quiver to see the Lord Buddha like this. And the Lord Buddha, he wasn't ready at that point to just pass into Parinibbana because he was still wanted to give, you know, more teachings to establish the uh, sasana so that he could go into the future without him. So what he did, or what he tells that he did is, by his iddhi powers, he managed to suppress that illness. He put that illness down. And he suppressed it. He could only suppress it for some time, but he did it. He suppressed that illness. Then he spent the rest of the range retreat there. There are, there are teachings and so on. And then sometime after the range retreat, it must be, you know, it's not telling, when it's telling this story, it's not really telling a biography, giving dates and all of this sort of thing, you know. We kind of piece it together. What, this, what the discourse is concerned with is collecting, the, is collecting the teachings that the Lord Buddha was giving in the last period of his life to see to the establishment of the sasana. That's their objective in, make, in making this story. Their objective is not really biographical. As I told you last, last time, you know, biography was not really an established form in, in those days, even you think about it, you see, even with King Ashoka, a, a great emperor who came along you know, a couple of hundred years or more later, there's no biography of Ashoka, not, uh, not a genuine uh, uh, biography that was written at the time. Uh, th there is a biography that was written a few centuries later, but it's mainly legendary, and it's not, it's not kind of uh, realistic in the way that this is realistic. This is like a realistic story, what, what is being told. They, they weren't really collecting a biography of the Buddha. It's incidental. Just like in the first talk that I gave, what their, what their intention was is to trace how the 
Sangha was formed, how the ordination procedures were formed, how the lay community was formed, because these things are formally important for knowing you know, how we can progress, how can we make ordinations. We need to know how the Lord Buddha set these things down. What are the relations between the lay community and the, and the Sangha? We need to know those. Incidentally, it tells you know, the biographical story of the Lord Buddha's first year. And here again, what they're trying to do is collect these teachings. And incidentally, they're um, telling a biography. So we, we don't know exactly when, but we do know that the Lord Buddha passed away in May. Uh, the following year, and three months before that period, two very important things happened. As I told you earlier, Sariputta came down, there were two routes actually, one would go through Baranasi and to Rajagaha, and one would come through Vaisali to Rajagaha. It's not marked on this map, but that would be another route, you see. You could come down to Baranasi. As, as far as I remember, if I remember it correctly, that was the route that he took. From Sarvati, he came down to Baranasi, and he came to Rajagaha. So he didn't meet the Buddha in Vaisali, but it, when he came to Rajagaha, went on to Nalanda, and then he went back to his home where he had been born. He was actually in the room that he was born when he passed away. It's quite moving in a way, because... Two weeks later, you see, then Moggallana uh, also passed away. So his two chief disciples, and he must have heard the news, he's not so far away. And people would come up, you see, and would have told him. So here he is, you know, he, he's been seriously ill. He's on basically what you can say is his last legs. He himself describes his body as being like a cart held together by vines. So, you know, he, he understands that he's, he himself is really at the end of his time and then he hears that his two main disciples has died it must have been quite quite moving for him I think and you know if we can get under the skin a little bit I think we can find it moving ourselves that this is how it was progressing towards the end of Lord Buddha's life you see and then the, the next thing that happened is and this is a very important thing when I'm, where I'm going to go back to the teaching again that was given at that point because it's so important. Mara came to the Lord Buddha and he asked him to enter into Parinibbana at that point. Now then, the Lord Buddha again spoke to Ananda. And this is very important. So I've, I've written, written it out here so that we can see. Lord Buddha said to Ananda, at one time, Ananda, I was living at Uruvela. That means, at, you know, near Bodhgaya. On the bank of the river Nairanjana, at the root of the goat herd Spanyan tree, in the first period after attaining awakening. According to the commentary, this was uh, in the eighth week uh, after the awakening. Then, Ananda, the wicked Mara approached me. And after approaching, he stood on one side. While standing to one side, Ananda, the wicked Mara said this to me. May the gracious one attain final emancipation now, reverend sir. May the fortunate one attain final emancipation. Now is the time, reverend sir, for the gracious one's final emancipation. You see, what, what he's trying to do is, he's, he's trying to tempt, if you like, Buddha into attaining final emancipation before he's had chance to give any teaching. This is before he's gone to Isi Pattern and given the first discourse or anything like that. It's while he's still in the area of Gaya. So he's trying to tempt the Buddha to just go, you know, just enter into final emancipation at that point and not give any teachings. But after this was said, Ananda, I said this to the wicked Mara. I will not attain final emancipation, wicked one, for as long as my monks, nuns, laymen and laywomen are not true disciples, accomplished, disciplined, confident, learned, bearers of the teaching, practicing in conformity with the teaching, correct in their practice, 
living in conformity with the teaching and having learned it from their own teacher will declare, reveal, make known, set forth, open up, analyze and make plain after giving a good rebuke of reason to the doctrines of others that have arisen and teach the miraculous teaching. What, what, it's, what, it, what he's telling, and this is the important thing you see that is being said at this point, is that from the very beginning the Buddha had in mind to establish the four assemblies. The four assemblies are the monks, the nuns, the laymen and the laywomen. The nuns, for instance, is not an afterthought. Although the nuns order was established six years later, and the, the monks order was established only, um, you know, a couple of weeks later, still from the very beginning the Buddha had it in mind that he would establish the nuns and that there would be four assemblies. <coughs> that means the Chattuparasa. So these four in assemblies were not some sort of afterthought, you know, they were there from the beginning in the Lord Buddha's idea of how the sasana was going to be established. And the other important thing, and it's, this is also a very important thing now, is that all four assemblies should be, you know, true disciples, accomplished, disciplined, confident and learned, and so on and so forth. Right? That means not just the monks and nuns should know the teaching and should be able to, you know, should know what is right and wrong in the teaching. But the laymen and the laywomen should also be learned in, in that way as well. And it's a very important part of the thing. You know, up until recently, for a long time, it's, it's kind of been thought that the only role, really, that the laymen and laywomen have is just to support the monks. You give dana to the monks and you hope to be reborn, you know, hope to have the opportunity to be reborn at the time of the uh, Buddha Metteya, at which time, you know, you get to hear the teaching you attain Nibbana. Uh, so their only role is just supporting the monks and the nuns and, you know, the idea of giving them proper and deep teachings and that they should be practicing those teachings, you know, has only just been re-established you know, perhaps say in the last 50 years or so. But this is an important thing. In Malaysia, I think we're really lucky because we have, in fact, very good and very learned uh, lay teachers. You know, I know a number of really excellent teachers. You know, they've really studied well and they're not only well educated, but they're well motivated as well. You know, some of these teachers in uh, KL and whatever, they're highly motivated, highly educated and able to give the teachings to other lay people. Now in the Lord Buddha's time there were also lay people who were singled out as being you know, great teachers. And we have their discourses as well. We, we have discourses by lay people that were uh, passed down in the tradition because they were recognized as great teachers. So, you see, again, when we're looking to re-establish the sasana in our own time and to, you know, to move it forward, to get it into the future on a successful and solid basis, then I think we really need to look at this, that the laymen and the laywomen need to be able to discriminate and know what is good and what is, uh, what is wrong. So the monks, the nuns, the laymen, and the laywomen, uh, the four assemblies, and they, they should all be learned and practicing. Now back to our story. You see, at the end of that uh, teaching, then the Lord Buddha said to Mara, you shouldn't worry, Mara. I've already made up my mind that in three months I will attain final emancipation. He's not said that because Mara has asked him, you know, it's because Mara has tempted him and he's agreed to that temptation. He'd already made that decision. But when Mara came and, and said this to him, then he, he just replied to Mara, don't, don't even bother about asking me to do this because I've already made up my mind that I will do it anyway. And so, you see, we now know that this is three months before the full moon in May. So that means we're in February. And in February, then, he leaves Vaisali 
and he goes on the last leg of this tour up this area. Now, bet between Vaisali and Partha, uh, I'll, I'll tell you the importance of Partha when we get there, but between there, he goes through all these places, Bandagama, Hatigama, uh, Ambagama, Jambugama, Boganagara. He goes through all, all of these places, and he's giving teachings all the way along. But you must understand that now he's 80 years old, and he's coming to the end of his days, and he's not fit like he was fit in the early days. It takes, you know, some time, quite a long. This is about um, something over 200 kilometers, I suppose, between Vaisali and Parva, you see. So he's going along here, and he's still giving teachings. The, all these teachings are like the basic teachings about Four Noble Truths, about the 37 things on the side of awakening, and, and so on and so forth. A lot of them are basic uh, teachings that, that were being remade or re-established and also things being laid down for the benefit of the uh, community after the Lord Buddha had passed away. But eventually he got to Partha and Partha, when he got to Partha, then Chanda, who was a goldsmith, he's known as Chanda the Smith, Chanda Kamara, then he invited the Buddha for Adana and the Lord Buddha agreed. So the Lord Buddha went to that uh, Dana and that was the last meal that the Lord Buddha ever had. Now there's some dispute about what that meal actually comprised. In the Pali, to me, it seems pretty straightforward. It actually says Sukhara Madhava and myself, the, the, the direct interpretation of that would be that tender pork. And myself, I believe that's what it was. Of course, some people don't like the idea that the Buddha was eating pork at that time, you see. But myself, you know, the most obvious translation of those words in that compound is as tender pork. Because people don't, don't like the idea of the Buddha eating pork, they come up with all sorts of ingenious kind of interpretations. Uh, Madhva means crushed. And so Sukhara means pig, you know, or hog. So they, they say it was a mushroom that was crushed by pigs. But it doesn't say mushroom, you see. It just says crushed pig, if you like, or crushed pork, you know, which would mean tender pork. But it, it seems to me like just because they can't, can't accept the idea that the Buddha was eating uh, tender pork. But my own idea is that is exactly what he, what he did take. But it doesn't matter anyway, because contrary to what a lot of people think, after that meal, you see, the Buddha fell seriously ill. The dysentery came back. But it, it, it's clear, both by what the Buddha says and by what the commentary says about this, that the two things are not linked. The fact that he took this meal, and that later... After that meal, he fell sick with dysentery. The one is not causing the other. The fact of the matter is that about nine months before, the Lord Buddha had fallen ill and he had suppressed that illness. Three months before, he had already told that he was only going to c continue for another three months and now that time is up. And uh, to dispel any doubts about this, you know, An Ananda said something like, oh, they're going to blame Chanda for giving you this meal. And the Lord Buddha said, don't blame Chanda for this meal. The two most beneficial meals that can ever be given by anybody at any time, the first meal is the meal that is given to the Buddha before he attains awakening. So that's the meal that Sujata gave. That was the, you know, the milk rice meal, as we remember it, that Sujata gave to the Buddha before he went and sat under the Bodhi tree. And the second meal is the meal that he takes before he attains Parinibbana, and that's the meal that was given by Chanda the Smith, you see. So it, it's made clear that this meal is not somehow to be blamed for his illness. He, he, he was already you know, already coming to his end, he had already made that decision. He took the meal, and afterwards, it's true, he did fall ill, but they're not linked 
and the commentary specifically goes out of the way to say that um, he took the meal and he fell ill, but he, he didn't fall ill because of the meal. It says specifically like this, that he didn't fall ill because of the meal. Then, but then after he fell ill, he still carried on on his journey. It's very sad. Uh, the commentary tells, not in the sutta, but the commentary tells that between Partha and Kusinara, which must be around 15 kilometers, I suppose, that Lord Buddha had to sit down 25 times. That means he couldn't even walk a kilometer without having to sit down because he was so exhausted with the dysentery that had re-arisen uh, at that point. And, well, anyway, for me, when I read that story and I kind of think about, you know, the Lord Buddha on his last, really on his last legs and the, the last moments in his life. And, you know, when you look at this, you see this journey, he's made Rajagaha, Pataligama, Vaisali, Pava, Kusina. It looks, you know, like he was trying to get back to Kapiluatu, trying to get back to his hometown, and that he wanted to, maybe he, he actually had it in mind that he would go home and pass away at home. I'm, I'm not sure, there's nothing that ever said that. It's just, when you look at it on a map, that's what it looks like he was trying to do, but... Anyway, he, he didn't make it. Kusinara is part of the Mala country. Kapilavatu was part of the Sakya country, you see. So he got to Kusinara and then he lay down on a stone slab, which is his last resting place. It was between two sal trees, they, they tell. And he lay down there never to arise again. Uh, that was in the evening. And he, he didn't pass away until the next morning. And now another very characteristic thing happened. Now, you know, by this time, the word had gone out that the Lord Buddha was kind of, um, you know, coming to, the, coming to his end. And one Paribhajika, uh, Subhadda, heard that the Lord Buddha, I don't know where he was actually, but anyway, he heard that the Lord Buddha was, you know, coming to the end of his life. He had never met the Lord Buddha. He had heard of him, but he had never met him. And he had also heard that it's very auspicious to see a Buddha, you know, in person. So he decided to go and meet the Lord Buddha before he passed away. And so he went to this Sal Grove, which was outside Kusinara, not in the town itself, of course, but in a grove outside. He went there, and then when the disciples, you know, he said he wanted to see Lord Buddha, and then when, you know, when the disciples heard about it, they said, don't bother, don't, don't bother the Lord Buddha, you know, he's on his deathbed here, you know, you can't bother him and give him trouble at this point in time. And the Lord Buddha, as he's lying on his deathbed, he heard this conversation going on, and he said, don't stop anybody, who wants to come and see me. See, it's very characteristic of the Buddha again. Even he's on his deathbed, he's not going to allow people to stop, other, you know, people who want to come and see him and hear the teachings and so forth. So he told them to, to let Subhadda come through. And Subhadda came through and there was, you know, some discussion. And then Subhadda became the very last person who was ordained face to face with the Lord Buddha himself. So he is the last member of the Sangha that was actually ordained in the presence of the Lord Buddha. He's the last disciple, Subhadda. You should remember, re try and remember that name. See, these people are important because of their position and, you know, what happened at that time. Then, Ananda went into Kusinara and he informed the Mallas, that's the this tribe who were living in Kusinara, he informed the Mallas that Lord Buddha was dying. You know, they wanted to come and pay their last respects. So Ananda, very, with a very good organizational spirit, brought them and he lined them up family by family. He allowed a family at a time to come and worship the Lord Buddha and then move on. And then another family come and worship the Lord Buddha and move on. And then another, like this. So they all had the opportunity, it must have been going on for hours, you see, but they all had the opportunity to worship the Lord Buddha 
that went on through the night. And then in the morning, just as the dawn was rising, what it tells is that the Lord Buddha went through all the jhanas and also through the ayatanas, that means the the what we later call the four higher jhanas, so that's the eight jhanas. He went up to the eighth jhana, he came back down to the first jhana, he went to, back to the fourth jhana, and having attained the fourth jhana, he, he entered into final emancipation, parinibbana, and that was how the Lord Buddha passed away. The story doesn't end there, because there's also, you know, we, 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 we have to find out what happens after that. In, in, the, in the discourse carries on after that, you see. And what, what they did is they, they wrapped the body. The Lord Buddha had already given instructions on how to cremate the body. So they wrapped the body in 600 wraps of silk and then they cremated the body. If you've ever seen a cremation done in India, you can still see them being done to this day. They have burning gats, what are called burning gats, where any member of the community has died. They'll be taken to that gat and then the body will be... It takes, you know, quite, quite a long time. In fact, they built, they built the burning gat for the Lord Buddha uh, at that point. But when they tried to set it alight, they couldn't set it alight. And they didn't know why they couldn't set it alight. So they asked Anuruddha, who was one of the monks who had great idi power, they asked Anuruddha, why can't they set it alight? And they said, they can't, they can't set it alight because Mahakasapa has not come here. Mahakasapa then was the most senior monk in the sasana. After Sariputta and uh, Moggallana had passed away, then Mahakasapa, I think he was coming up from Pava, you see, Mahakasapa was the most senior monk in the... Uh, sasana, and they, they couldn't uh, cremate the body until Mahakasapa got there, but eventually he got there, and then they started the cremation. If you've ever seen a, cre a cremation done, you know, in this way that they do it even to this day, it takes actually, you know, quite a few hours. It's not, it's not like when they put them into the, these crematoriums these days, these ele electric crematoriums where the body is burned actually really in a, you know, a very short time, five minutes or ten minutes or whatever it is, and immediately you can take the bones away. It takes a long time to burn a body, you know, like a good few hours. But at the end of that, then there were the, the relics were there. So now we go on to the next map, and this map is showing the distribution of the relics. First of all, the, 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 the thing is, once they got the relics, you see, many people felt that they had claims on the Lord Buddha's relics. Like the Sak Sakyas, who were his family, they th felt like they had a claim. The Malas, who were in Kusinara, felt like they had a claim. Ajata Sattu, who was one of his big supporters, he felt like he had a claim. The Vaisalians, where he'd spent the last was, they felt like they had a claim. And they sent their representatives to try to get the relics, you see. And there was really, like, it was building up into a big conflict. They were going to have a fight as, you know, so who could get these, who could have the relics of the Lord Buddha? And then, you know, somebody said, it's not suitable to fight over the relics of the Lord Buddha. That's not a, that's not a suitable way to uh, behave, you know? And then what they did is they called in a Brahmin, and uh, the Brahmin is called Dona, and then Dona divided the relics into eight portions and the chalice that he used to divide those relics up into, that chalice became a ninth one and he took it himself back to Veta Deepa. So you see we got Kapiluvattu, Pava, Kusinara, Ramagana, uh, Pipiliwana, Alakapa, Veta Deepa, Vesali and Rajaga. Uh, that's nine places, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Eight, eight actual material relics and the urn. We don't know exactly where these places were. They were in this area. That's why it's kind of circled like this. Ramagama is here. And then at all these places, they built a stupa over the relics of the Lord Buddha. This becomes important later because in... 
Ashoka's time, you know, as we were saying earlier, Ashoka was the great supporter of the Sasana. Ashoka ruled over an area about this size. It's more than what is present day India. Most of what is present day India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, uh, but excluding part of the south of India. He ruled over that whole area, you see. And it tells that he established 84,000 temples. I think this 84,000, it really just means, you know, like a, a, a very large number. That's what it really means, a very large number of temples. And then he went to these stupas and he opened those stupas up and then he redivided the relics that were found there and he put them in all of these different temples throughout India. He div he d so that was the division of the relics. And it's basically at that point that the discourse about the last year of the Lord Buddha's life ends. So everybody say sadhu.